Paul McCombe, welcome to Trade Finance Talks TV. Hi, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, a pleasure. And, and here we are at uh, UK International Trade Week. Uh, can you give a bit of an introduction? Who are you, where are you from, and what do you do? Okay. Um, so, Paul McComb, Director of UK Exports at the Department for International Trade. Um, I've been responsible uh, predominantly for the department's strategy on supporting exports, increasing exports, um, some practical things that we're doing, particularly with, um, with Europe uh, and the sort of adaption of the TCA. Um, Amongst many other things, which I'm sure we're going to get onto. Yeah, absolutely, and and, and you know the perfect person I, I've been I've been meaning to uh, meaning to talk to because I guess you know if we take a bit of a step back and look at right now mm -hmm. for UK trade and exports, we're seeing a really difficult trading environment, macro macroeconomics, geopolitical context. We have the Russia the Russia Ukraine war, food shortages, record record inflation levels. How are these events currently impacting UK exports? Yeah, I mean, it's it's if you reflect back on sort of events when you think in this country we've adapted to a new trading relationship with Europe, as you said, the pandemic, which the whole globe has had to deal with, the inflationary pressures, Ukraine uh, and the invasion by Russia. I mean, the list is pretty phenomenal. I mean, in very simplistic terms, the risk has just gone like up. Um, and I'm, you know, from my engagement with businesses, um, I mean, the numbers are one thing, but what businesses like is certainty, and they like to understand and price in, you know, the sort of uncertainty so that they can still get on, do business, make things happen. And I think my sense is that there are some sort of prevailing challenges that companies have always had. Some of that could be around the cost of entering a market, the cost of continuing in a market could be about knowledge, networks, building trusting relations. There's lots of stuff which is, is enduring. I think the sense more and more recently is how they get a reliable assessment of the risk and how they then sort of deal with that, uh, which obviously trade finance is a, is a part of this discussion today. Um, but it, how, how they manage those risks um, and a big part of what we we do is is really see well work work in government um, help in that space, but I think that's that's the big the biggie for me in terms of managing risk. Thanks, Paul. And I guess let's let's go straight into the into the numbers and, mm -hmm. and, and per the strategy that um, DIT yeah. published published last year. I guess UK is really looking to pivot its new trading relationship and, and actually establishing more of a, a, a connection with Asian markets. Mm -hmm. Are you actually seeing a change in the numbers in terms of our real trading figures with our Asian partners? So I think in, in sort of general terms, um, I mean, a lot of the deals, as you know, that we have been doing or pursuing are yet to fully sort of bite in a practical sense. Um, I think my sense is that um, securing a better trading environment, and this is what one of the things we've learnt uh, during the adjustment to the new trading relationship with Europe, securing a better trading environment is absolutely where government should be occupying itself, but making it sort of more straightforward. But then there is a really practical element to how businesses sort of take advantage of that. So, for example, when you do a deal on goods and you secure tariff-free access, for some companies that means they've got to engage with things like rules of origin and satisfying the requirements of that in order to take advantage of those, those, those sort of tar tariff deals. So, um, so there's a very practical side to that sort of, uh, sort of big picture. If I was sort of stepping back and saying, how does it look and feel? Um, Interestingly, the numbers, if you just look at pure numbers and people will say, yeah, but inflation, non-monetary gold, there's all sorts of other numbers in it. You know, the late, latest statistics that we published suggested something like 728 billion of uh, exports. Now, that's from a, an average of around 640 billion between sort of 2016 to pre-COVID. So that's quite a big number. Now, some of that is for sure 
uh, inflationary. But when you strip those effects out, there's still something of the order of 40 to 50 billion of increase. So the numbers are going in the right direction. Um, and we are seeing sort of increases in both EU, non-EU um, in, in, that, in that regard. The, 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 the sort of strategy of getting into those Asian markets, getting those traders, is as much as anything to rekindle relationships that you know we've had for, for many years. A lot of those countries are Commonwealth countries uh, that we've done deals with as well. And um, I think we're at the start of what could be an even bigger boost if companies feel confident to follow through on those trade deals. Um, so I think, I think from my perspective at the moment, it's still work in progress. It's not there yet. No one's sort of declaring victory uh, in, in all of this. Are we doing the right things? I think we are. Mm. Um, we're certainly doing the things you would expect government to do, get in there. I mean, the, what's the alternative? Sit on your hands and sort of hope. Well, we're not doing that. Um, so so I, I think work in progress is the way I would describe it, and more to do. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I guess looking at those, those, those figures, that, that potential mm -hmm. 50 billion um, increase if you strip out inflation and versus the, the pre-pandemic levels, I guess the objective is always to increase those numbers e even more. If you look at the barriers that corporates and SMEs are facing mm -hmm when it comes to exporting to overseas markets. Can you walk us through the key export barriers and also then talk about what government can do yeah. to intervene <clears throat> and, and I guess make trade easier? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are four persistent barriers and we survey this every year and the same sort of message comes back. Um, and some of these are more, will be felt more by SMEs and it's not that they're not felt by the big corporates, but you know, there's a general sense that they will have a dedicated department that can get its head around what, what it needs to do. The first one is um, cost. And it's just the practical cost of uh, the paperwork or the systems you need to put in place in order to sell your goods overseas, or in some cases secure your license if it's in a services trade. Um, uh, and then it's things like shipping costs, um, duties, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see how trade deals can help attack some of that. So cost is number, number one. I think secondly is knowledge. Um, and, and that can be about, sometimes companies fall foul when they're trying to trade on the fly. You know, they learn by doing. So they haven't done a huge amount of research to realize that to get product X through customs in country Y, market Y, you need certain things. Um, and then they fall foul of those, uh, those things. So knowledge is a, is a sort of second barrier. Third, and this, uh, this, this is real. I mean, I always say trade is a contact sport. And what I mean by that is you sort of, you, you, you feel trust when you meet people. And if you think of selling to another market, what you're trying to do is build up trust. Uh, with the buyers, um, so you know, having a trusted buyer, getting the right network, knowing you can take that email inquiry or that phone call or whatever it is that prompted your interest uh, and follow through and take uh, you know uh, fulfil on that. So I think networks, trusted relationships, the third area. Then the fourth area can sometimes be actually the investment they need to do domestically to build the capacity to fulfill. Um, I spent four years out in China, based in Hong Kong, and actually the scale of that market is huge. Uh, the purchasing power is huge. And um, some of the companies would come through with you know, a capacity to do, I don't know, a pallet of whatever the thing was a month, and meet buyers who'd say, let's start with a container a month and then we'll go to a decent order, and they'd just be overwhelmed. But of course, that's the big opportunity. But raising the finance, taking the decision to invest in your own capacity to fulfill. So they seem to be the four persistent sort of barriers, and that comes through year after year 
in the sort of surveys that we do. The export strategy, which uh, you mentioned before we published it uh, in November 2021, um, it, unlike dare I say, lots of government strategies, it was, I thought, very grounded, very practical, and it talked about practical things we would do to help deal with those specifics. So, for example, they take knowledge. We launched an export academy, um, which basically does everything from, you know, how do you export, through to I'm working in AI, um, and I'm interested in getting into you know, particular markets and having sessions on sector-specific stuff, market-specific stuff. So you're, in, you're, you're getting a sense of if you're going to enter into this market, be aware, great opportunities might not get paid very quickly, or this is the way they like to do business. So you, you're getting deep insight uh, through that. But the beauty of the academy is people can register, they can learn, they can log on uh, before they start spending serious cash. Um, so there's things like that. When it comes to networks, we've got 1,600 people in 108 countries. Um, we can, for the right companies, get introductions. Uh, and, and the thing is, being the British government over in another mar foreign market, which you don't know terribly well, just builds your confidence a bit. So if we introduce you to someone who's a buyer, the chances are, you know, it's all going to be good. Um, now, we don't necessarily do complete due diligence on absolutely everyone. So at the end of the day, a business still has to make their own decision. But, you know, the chances are we're introducing you to companies or organisations we've dealt with for decades, and we know, and they're trusted. Um, so these measures are all geared around um, just helping in, in, in that space. And actually, trade finance, uh, I said at the start of this, you know, the big thing that everyone's facing is increased risk. Trade finance can be a huge enabler in the sense of it's just taking some of that risk on in order for you to carry on and feel confident in your trade. And if it does go wrong, we hope not. But if it does, trade finance is there to sort of help. Thanks, Paul. So, so just to summarise those, those four points, really, cost, knowledge, trust, and, and investment or, or finance. And I'll talk about the final piece mm -hmm. now because I guess you know, that's the reason why Trade Finance Global, UK Export Finance and the Department for International Trade very recently launched the guide to yeah. trade and, and export finance and, and I guess there are a number of different challenges but but trade and access to trade finance and export finance is, is really critical and, and, and in a world where interest rates therefore lending rates or, or borrowing rates have, have gone up um, as well as an understanding of the complexities of, of trade finance, which mm -hmm. is a very paper-based, paper-heavy business, has made the environment for corporates and SMEs to access trade finance. I mean, can you talk through some of the reasons why trade finance really is a, a barrier to entry for, for corporates and, and SMEs, and, and also what government can do to help bring both public actors like... Mm -hmm export credit agencies and private actors like banks together to help finance that, that gap. And I'm sure you know there is a 1.7 trillion US dollar global trade finance gap and SMEs suffer the most out of those. Yeah. I mean, and this feels like it's been a perpetual challenge. It's, you know, it, people even being aware that such a thing exists. So promoting it, the work you've done on the guide, those sorts of things are really important um, because it, it, it is quite interesting if you think about it. The, the whole, if you, if you stripped back the process of global trade, it's pretty archaic. Um, lots of paper, lots of sort of trust points which are clearly also failure points along the way. And um, Everyone comes along to try and fix a bit of uh, the, the sort of problem. And, and I think the challenge on, on trade finance is because it's, it's actually people being aware, people being able to really understand how best to utilise that. And I know with UK Export Finance, they've done a lot to just try and promote not just the product, but then by showing people who got something 
for what purpose so that they can see themselves. So the case studies that go on to GovUK are actually quite important as well because people need to see themselves to say, oh, I could, I could sort of, uh, uh, you know, get that uh, facility. Um, and as you say, you know, what's not to want? We're ensuring the buyer against buying from you. I mean, it sounds almost unbelievable <laughs> as a as a scheme. But you know, when I when I, again when I was in China, and I would explain this, not that they necessarily wanted uh, the cover, but you know, this, it gets them going and gets them thinking. Actually, this is a reason to buy British, um, and that's one of the big reasons why we we put that in place. The general export facility to help people who have to invest, that point around investing in your business to fulfill. You know, again, uh, op opportunities there. So I think, I mean, it slightly moves on to <clears throat> what we've seen in recent years, which is, you know, do you carry on trying to sell all these different component bits of support in a very disjointed, largely archaic, sort of global trading system, which seems to sort of work. Uh, I, I always consider it a minor miracle every day that everything just ticks, particularly when you bring logistics into that. Or you start to look at, uh, you know, the work that some of these big platforms are doing where they sort of, you know, selling platforms. I'm thinking of the Alibabas, the Amazons of the world, who've just lifted the, I mean, of course, there's a cost to everything, but they've lifted the, the grunt off your average trader and said, sell it on here and I'll take care of that and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll operate from there. So, so I think for me, um, it, it will, we'll be in a never-ending cycle of trying to keep promote and keep people aware that there is all this support available. But if I was a business, wouldn't I just want it to be simple? You know, in this world where we can do everything on our phones, why, why are we not there sort of, sort of yet? So I think there's big ambitions for that. And when I, again, if I sort of reflect on my experience in, in China, if you were opening a store, you typically opened it on, you know, WeChat. You wouldn't think of setting a website up and you traded through systems like that. It was a very different um, sort of mindset, albeit a lot of that only really operates within in the mainland. Thanks, Paul. So just to summarize, the guide really includes an overview of some of the, the products available, the most common risks, where, where to go for help, and also the current trade finance landscape. A, lot, a lot's really changed in, in the past few years, specifically with regards to the digitalization of, of trade. So, so the guide really, really covers that. It also has a, an extensive glossary because actually some of the terminology used in trade and export finance is, is, is quite complicated. So actually by dispelling some of those complicated terms, um, um, it can help corporates and SMEs looking to start or continue on their trading journey. I guess the most important part is really looking at some of the processes involved. So, so we've included a, a list, a step-by-step -step list of processes involved in securing trade finance, as well as how acquiring trade finance can help both from a public and, and from a private perspective. So, so the, there, there are lots of good tips and tricks in, in this guide and it's available to download on, on, our, on our website www.tradefinanceglobal.com um, forward slash export finance and, 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 and it really shows how the Department for International Trade, UK Export Finance and, and tr Trade Finance Global can support SMEs and corporates throughout the trade finance process. So I guess, Paul, coming, coming back to some of the points we discussed mm -hmm. earlier, when it, comes to, when it comes to UK exporters, can you give SMEs some tips, some really tangible tips on, on, on how they can navigate this truly complicated landscape yeah. and actually turn this into a bit of an opportunity? Mm -hmm. So we, um, and I'll reflect a little bit on the experience of SMEs adjusting uh, to our new trading relationship with the EU as an example. And I'll explain what we've done there. So government did a huge amount of campaigning, get ready for Brexit, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, pages and pages of guidance, beautifully written on GovUK. Um, actually, lots of different sort of helpline type facilities, very specific 
Um, when, when we looked at the sum total of that, I think it end, ended up at around 10,000 pages of guidance and 34 helplines. So that in itself is, is almost too much for, for people. And I think what we learned a lot talking to SMEs is they don't want to become experts at exporting. They just want to fulfill a, an order, make a sale, do a deal. Um, that, you know, that can grow and they, some, some go further. So we launched in October last year the export support service. In very, very simple, t simple terms, we just said, if you're stuck, ring, these, ring this number. Um, and what we've done over the last year is we've learned a huge amount of what are the sort of questions that people get stuck on. Um, so in July this year, we launched a digital service which helps people to know precisely what it is that they need to, to do. Well, you just go in there and you type in the goods you're selling, you find the commodity code, you click the country you're selling to, and it goes, these are the four things you need to do, or here's the one thing you need to do. It's really, really simple. If you're still stuck on the back of that, you can request a call with one of our trade experts. They'll call you back, they'll talk through what your issues are, they'll help you through that. Now, we, that service was largely focused on Europe. It expanded to Russia, Ukraine, because there's a lot going on, and we thought we've just got to insert ourselves into this uh, so that we can help businesses navigate that. We expanded to cover the whole of Eastern Europe and Central Asia on the 10th of October. We'll be expanding that even further to cover the whole world by March 23. And our simple message is, if you're stuck, go there first. The good thing about where we're heading with this service, because you do learn a lot as you listen to what people are sort of dealing with, there's, there's a few thoughts. So one will help you with the, the, the specific that you're dealing with. And if we don't know the answer, we'll find someone who does, which is really quite important. I think for certain businesses where we see, hang on, this is a, I mean, we get calls from everything who, you know, I want to sell 100 quid's worth of goods through to, I've got a two million pound order and I'm waiting for this. When you see those, particularly as people get into more sizable trades, then increasingly we'll be routing those to our trade advisors into equally export finance and starting to, to say, for certain companies, there's a bigger suite of products here that you should to tap into. And the way to think about this is a kind of, increasingly it'll be a sort of primary point of entry uh, into the government offer, and some of that might bounce out. I mean, we talk to partner business groups who are very well placed, so some of the trade bodies, etc. We'll say, talk to these guys, they can help you, or uh, refer to the guide that is available, th that sort of thing. So, so that's probably the biggest, simplest thing that we're offering. If I was to sort of list all the individual things we've got, that would probably be a turn off mm -hmm. for businesses. But it's a lot easier for us to sort of sell to people the idea of come here if you want to start your journey and we can get you into the academy, you start learning. If you're already trading, let's set you up with trade advisors. Let's get you talking to people in country. Because, you know, how do you, how do you find the guy to speak to in mm -hmm. Kazakhstan, you know? Um, probably really difficult. So yeah. we've got those routes, we've got those connections. Thanks, Paul. I mean, it's really interesting from, from an SME perspective because they don't necessarily want to learn all the nuances mm -hmm. of trade, export, finance, etc. They want to fulfill orders. So I think it's a really tangible and very important signposting helpline. And, and of course, there's lots of evidence to suggest that SMEs and, and businesses who, who export are likely to be more innovative, they'll be more competitive, uh -huh. they'll have happier employees, they'll be more profitable. So, so there are lots of, um, lots of advantages of, of, of yeah. UK companies who, who actually export. I guess just taking a bit of a step back and, and, and you know, to my original first question, during these current very, very challenging times for, for UK PLC, um, why is now the time to consider exporting? Um, so, I mean, we always think now, and now could be tomorrow, it could be yesterday, but um, I guess once, and this is, it's the experience 
of companies who decide to export that keep us continually motivated to promote this. I mean, we know. I mean, if we do the do the numbers, you know, exporting companies are you know, they pay more, they're twenty one percent more productive. They actually cover about a quarter of the working population in the UK businesses who export, and we 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 when we see the success of a company who decides not just to serve the domestic market and start to uh, grow exponentially and you'd be amazed the demand for British goods is incredibly strong still and services and I suppose you know we look at this and think gosh what a wasted opportunity if you're not exporting I go lots of business roundtables and there'll be people there who are you know um, export champions who are selling uh, you get on get into the ladder get moving and then other businessmen who are like oh it's it's expensive, how do I know? I don't want to spend a lot of money and then find I don't get the order. And it's just building that confidence and it goes back to this sort of de-risking as, as well. But the reason, the reason now is important is because there is massive growth potential, particularly in the markets that we are uh, pursuing trade uh, agreements with and trading relationships, in addition to our, you know, our strong trading relationship with the EU, with the US. So there's massive opportunity, and there is going to be increasing middle classes with demand for sort of British goods and services. And so we can see it, I mean, and you can see the predicted growth. There's plenty of reports out there. And if businesses don't jump in sort of early and get, get into that, uh, get, get into the game, it just feels a sense of we might be missing something that we shouldn't. Um, and I can tell you from, again, my time out in, in Asia in particular, um, there is a really strong connection uh, with, with Britain, with what Britain's got to offer. And there's still a lot of trust in Britain. Um, and, and sort of building on that can only be good for business. Thank you very much, Paul, and, and I could definitely concur with, with what you're saying. Just get out there and see see the opportunities, talk talk to other people and, and, and really look at those those opportunities and, and, and there, there are endless opportunities for, for, for companies. So thank you very much. And, and just a reminder to our audience at, at Trade Week, um, you can download the guide at tradefinanceglobal.com forward slash export hyphen finance and, and there, there are also lots of other links to the signposting services that Department for International Trade and UK Export Finance offer. Thank you very much for joining us on Trade Finance Talks TV. Thank you very much.